Okay. Good morning, ladies. My name is Miriam, and I'm better known as Moses' big sister, okay? Okay, I borrowed these from Ben Franklin. I'm going to try them on. Oh, there you all are. Okay, let me tell you how it all started. We Hebrews were in slavery to the Egyptians. There must have been oh, over a million of us. Pharaoh had commanded that all the little baby boys born to the Hebrew women were to be killed. What a schmutz. <laughs> My mother had just given birth to little baby Moses, and she tried to hide him. But when she no longer could, she placed him in a little basket and sent him on a river cruise. <laughs> but definitely not the all-you-can-eat buffet kind. You know what I mean? So my mother's faith in Yahweh was so strong, she prayed that he would take care of her little boy. I ran down alongside the river to see what would happen to the basket. I witnessed God's divine intervention. Pharaoh's daughter was coming to bathe in the river. Now catch this, right where the basket was caught in the reeds. I waited on the shore, and when Pharaoh's daughter heard the crying baby and saw that he was a Hebrew, do you know what she did? She had pity on him. I mustered all the courage this little Hebrew girl had in her, and I asked her if she would like to, she wanted me to find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby. And she said, yes. <laughs> my heart was beating so fast. I ran home and I brought my mother to her, right? Pharaoh's daughter, unbeknownst to her, placed little baby Moses into his own mother's arms and even offered to pay her. I mean, seriously, is God good or what? Uh, fast forward 80 years. Moses, our brother Aaron, and I were reunited. Moses and Aaron boldly went before the throne of Pharaoh to demand he let our people go, right? Talk about Huxpa. <laughs> I stayed behind with the Hebrew women, encouraging them to get their things packed because I was sure we were going to be delivered from slavery. And sure as the Messiah's coming back, we found ourselves crossing the Red Sea on dry ground. <laughs> Oh, what joy. I danced and sang a song. Oh, and the people exalted the Lord with me. Oh, happy day. <laughs> I must admit, no one had ever led worship before. Mm -hmm. I was the first woman. I was in my glory. <laughs> I even had t-shirts printed up for the worship team. Blue is a good color on me, don't you think? <laughs> anyway, um, I was just so, so excited about being a worship leader and being a singer and a dancer and worshiping God. But I thought, I think I might audition for Israel's Got Talent. <laughs> I mean, I could just see myself rising to fame with my singing and my dancing. Uh, I could see my name in lights. <laughs> they really didn't have lights back then, but I could see my name in lights. <laughs> but Moses was stealing my thunder. Hmm. Everyone was focused on him as the one to lead because God obviously favored him. I mean, I saved him when he was a baby. He owed me big time, right? I found myself sharing my frustration with Aaron and found out he felt a bit slighted too. So we went to Moses with our complaints. Why not? 
Everyone else dumped on him. We were family, so we had more of a right than the others. Besides, I did not like the new wife he had taken. She was from Ethiopia. She wasn't even a Hebrew. It became ugly. The more I thought about it, the madder I got. Unfortunately, I took Aaron with me right down this broad road of destruction. We walked up to Moses and got in his face. You know, nose to nose and toes to toes. And I said, do you think that God has only spoken through you? Hasn't he spoken through us as well? That's when God spoke to me, all right. <laughs> he seriously got my attention. I immediately broke out with leprosy. Ew. Right? I look like Olaf. You know, white as snow. <laughs> Moses prayed for me, and I was eventually healed, but not before suffering shame and humiliations galore. Uh, just a reminder to you ladies, stay in your own lane. Do not mess with God's anointed. Do what God has called you to do, and don't let jealousy and envy make you say or do something stupid. I am humbly going to stick to what I do best, singing and dancing and praising the Lord. <laughs> Hava Nagila Hava Nagila Hava Nagila Venishma Hava Amanda Hava Amanda come on up and teach us the word Woo! <laughs> uh, That was awesome I have a different tone just so you know. I'm not quite that funny. I don't dance. Sometimes I sing, but not today. Um, I do have an announcement, though. Yay. OK. The Christmas dessert is coming. Yay. Um, so Christmas dessert is coming. We have two nights this year. We are going to do Thursday, November 30th, and Friday, December 1st at 7 PM. And we have Sandy McIntosh as our speaker. Isn't that going to be so fun? She did our retreat, and she was amazing. She was so much fun. And so we've invited her back, and she's agreed to come and do our Christmas dessert. So it's going to be great. We also are looking for some people to be table hostesses. So if you're interested in that, you can see either of those things. Buy a ticket or be a table hostess. You can see Christina afterwards. So thanks, Christina. <laughs> All right. And thank you, Chris, for that awesome portrayal of Miriam. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to turn it serious now. Um, <laughs> uh, well, good morning. For those of you who don't know me um, or you're new to Bible study, my name is Amanda Dufour. I've been going to Calvary Chapel Santee for about 19 years now. My husband, Chris, is the youth pastor. Uh, we have three amazing kids in ages from 8 to 15. Um, our whole family has really been blessed by this church um, and the, by the bodies of believers that are here. And it's just an honor to be with you all today. Um, I've been given the privilege to share Miriam's story with you. I love that we're learning about different women of the Bible this year. I love to read biographies and autobiographies, not that I have a lot of time to read because of my children's ages, um, but I love learning from other people's stories. I love to see the life that they lived. There's so much wisdom that we can glean in a life well lived. In life, I think that there's really two types of people. There's those that learn from other people's mistakes, and then there's those that have to just live it out the hard way, right? Um, growing up, and even still today, I'm the one that has to, I, I watch other people, and I'm like, oh, that, you made a fool of yourself. I'm not going to do that. People are like, oh, that was the wise thing. Not really. It's purely a pride thing. I don't want to look like the fool. So I learn from other people's mistakes. So I'm not going to do something first, because what if that doesn't work out? You, go ahead, you try it, and then if it's safe, then I'll do it. Um, that's, that's how I am. I've been that way my whole life. Um, <laughs> I will happily allow someone else to go first and look like a fool. Um, but I really do believe there's much to learn from looking at the women of the Bible. So let's pray, and then we're going to jump into Miriam's life. Uh, dear God, I just thank you so much for each of these women, Lord, who 
have put aside their morning, they've put aside their time, Lord, to come and sit at your feet, Lord, to come and get closer to you, to glean from your words, Lord, to glean from the Bible, Lord, to fellowship with other believers in Christ. And God, I just pray that as we learn about Miriam today, Lord, that your words would speak through me, Lord, that it would not be me, but you. And God, I pray that you would draw us all closer together, Lord, and reveal to us the things that we need to take away from this story today. In your name we pray. Amen. Miriam's life is a beautiful picture um, of what it looks like to live a life in full submission to God. And then it also is a good picture of what it looks like when we stop submitting to God. The Bible does not give us a lot of information about Miriam, but what is there is powerful and it's full of life lessons. She is a remarkable woman. She was the eldest child of Amram and Jacbed, both of whom were from the tribe of Levi. If you remember, it was this tribe that God would eventually choose to become the priestly family of the Israelites. She is the oldest of three siblings. I can relate to the burden that that is. I am the oldest of three siblings. Some of you might have met my younger sister last week. But just kidding, I really do love being a big sister. Miriam is the oldest sister to her brother Aaron, who eventually became the high priest, and then of course Moses, her baby brother, who we know led the people out of Egypt. She is probably best known for watching over her baby brother Moses while he floated in a basket, eventually being picked up by Pharaoh's daughter. But there is so much more to her. Miriam is also the first of only a few female prophetesses listed in the Bible. In the Bible, a prophet is a person who proclaims God's word and therefore speaks for God. Therefore, she was a spokeswoman for God. Miriam also led worship, as we just saw from Chris, specifically women in worship, as they made their way through the desert on the way to the promised land. It is also believed that Miriam remained single and did not marry which would have been extremely uncommon in that day, when culturally a woman's main role was to be married and bear children. But it shows us a single Miriam, and she's a mighty woman for God, and God had a very powerful calling on her life that had nothing to do with marriage or bearing children. Her singleness did not stop her from doing the Lord's work. The Bible shows us three distinct chapters in Miriam's life, and today we're gonna look at each of those chapters. In the first chapter, we see Miriam as a little girl, She's no more than about 12 years old, although some people hypothesize she might be as young as eight. Let's look at her childhood. We're going to take a look at Exodus 2, verse 1 through 10. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maiden to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister Miriam said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. Miriam did not have a happy-go-lucky childhood. She was growing up under extreme conditions. The Hebrew people were oppressed by Pharaoh. In Exodus 1.14, we read that they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. They were enslaved and forced to do hard manual labor. They were oppressed, and in an effort to keep the people under his control, Pharaoh had ordered all the male babies be killed once they were born. This was not a happy or healthy environment. These were ugly and depressing circumstances that she was being raised in. And yet we see Miriam, a young girl, standing and being bold in her faith in the purpose that she was given. Reading this story, I am struck by her obedience. 
In the midst of significant trial, she was obedient to her parents. I have three kids, and I've worked in education my entire adult life. It is a rare thing in this day and age to see blind obedience. Kids rarely obey without question. Usually they ask why they have to do that. They want an explanation. They want the whole thing outlined. Well, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen then? They want all the potential outcomes. And usually somewhere along the lines, it eventually ends in me telling my children, just do it because I said so. And it's frustration. And we're quick to get irritated with our children for not just doing what we say. But don't we do the exact same thing to God? God calls us to something. How often do we immediately say, yes, Lord? How often do we submit to his will without questioning him as if he doesn't have our best interest at heart? I am struck by young Miriam's faith and the faith of her parents. We read in Hebrews 11:23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. His parents had faith that God had a purpose and a plan for Moses' life. And as part of that bigger plan, Miriam was given a task. We don't see Miriam questioning why she had to do something that she was asked. We, didn't, we do not see her questioning her role or questioning if the plan would work or justifying why she didn't think it would work. We just see her watching over him. Philippians 2.14 tells us that we are to do all things without complaining and disputing, and that is what we see her doing. We also do not see Miriam fearful, although I don't think it's because she wasn't fearful. I think she must have been. I have an eight-year-old. If you know him in any way, even just slightly, you know that he is very fearless. But if I were to ask him to go watch over a sibling who was at risk of being killed, I know that my son would absolutely be terrified. And it would be a battle to get him to do it. And yet we see Miriam watching over her baby brother, being brave. I just don't think I would be that brave. In fact, I know I wouldn't. I don't know how many of you guys live in Santee, but at like 3 o'clock in the morning, there was like a low-flying jet. I think there was a couple of them. It woke me up, and I was like, that's it? The war has come. It's World War III, and I freaked out, right? Like, it's a plane, Amanda. Go back to bed. I would not be as brave as she is. Like, I know fear drives me. Fear drives so much of our lives as women. We fear what happens. We fear what might happen. We fear what could happen. And we often let fear cripple us from doing the things that God has called us to do. Years ago, Meef told me that if I was afraid of doing something, it was probably the enemy holding me back from something that God wanted me to do. She encouraged me to do the opposite of what my fear told me to do. So when I didn't feel like I should go to a women's retreat, I should go anyway. When I feel like I shouldn't go to Bible study, I should go anyway. When I feel like I don't want to introduce myself to that new person at a shower because I don't know who they are and they don't know me, I have nothing important to say, I should introduce myself anyway. God will bless our faithfulness to him when we follow his will. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. We know the end of the story, and so it seems simple that she would obey and have complete faith that the trial is going to turn out great in the end. But Miriam and her parents did not know that. But they did know that they served a good God. Their faith in God was big. This little girl stood on the riverbank and had a front row seat to see how God was going to deliver. This event must have shaped her faith in God. Colossians 2.7 says, Let your roots grow down deep into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. God uses this situation in so many ways. He never left young Miriam. He was right by her side that day, giving her the courage and the strength to talk to Pharaoh's daughter and offer a plan. Her boldness and ability to speak confidently in the face of danger allowed for a beautiful plan that not only allowed Moses to live, but allowed him to be raised by his biological parents, to gain a foundation solid in God, that allowed his biological mother to be paid to raise him, in the ways of the Lord, and then allowed him to be raised in Pharaoh's house, where it says in Acts 7, 22, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. And every aspect of Moses' life, from living 
with his biological parents to living in Pharaoh's house, it all equipped him to be the leader that he needed to be to get God's people out of captivity. God took what looked like an impossible situation and he made an amazing way to freedom for his people. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise you for your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Miriam is a great example of this verse. Young Miriam, despite her youth, played an important role in saving the life of her brother Moses. She was his protector. I think as parents, especially as mom, we often try to protect our kids from all sorts of trials and all sorts of pain. We try to smooth out the heartaches and the challenges, and we want them to have a happy life where everything is perfect for them. And I think there's something admirable in that. But circumstances are the fingers of God, and no circumstance is ever wasted. God uses every circumstance to grow not only us, but to grow and mature our children. Miriam faced a huge trial before she was even a teenager. Her parents didn't shield her from it. They didn't protect her from the things that were going on in that day. She would have known that baby boys were being murdered. She would have known that her brother could have drowned in the river that day. She would have known that Pharaoh's daughter could have been cruel and killed him or ordered her family punished or killed. Her knowledge of just how bad the world was made the plan of God so big that her faith was strengthened and it helped to mature her into the strong woman of God into the leader that she eventually became. God took one of the scariest times of her life to deepen her faith. You are never too young to be used by God. You're never too young to see the mighty hand of God working. Your children are never too young to be used by him and never too young to see his hand. Some of us parents are getting in the way of God when we're trying to protect our children from the trials of this world. We need to trust God enough to use that trial to walk alongside our kids, not to shield them from trials, not to pretend that it's not there, but to walk with them through the trial and show them who they can rely on, to show them that God is trustworthy and that he can do all things. We don't hear about Miriam again until Exodus 15. And by this time, she's advanced in age. Some estimate that she's in her 80s or 90s at this time. And for some context, let me summarize some of chapter 14. Pharaoh had let God's people go, but he changed his mind, and his army is chasing them through the desert. And at God's direction, Moses stretches out his hand, and the Red Sea parted, allowing the Israelites to walk on dry land. The Egyptian army followed them, and God brought the Red Sea back together, crashing onto and killing the entire Egyptian army. It was a complete victory for the Hebrew people. Exodus 15 opens up with a celebration of this victory, and it is the first time that we see a worship song in Scripture. The people were worshiping and praising God for the great works that he has done, for saving his people from the Egyptians. And in verse 20 and 21, we read about Miriam. It says, Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The scripture gives us only a small piece of information, but the context tells us so much about her character. In the second chapter of her life, we see that she's a strong leader. She's a prophetess, so we know that she's a spokeswoman for God to the Hebrew people. Here, it specifically tells us that she took the musical instruments and she led the women worship, in worship to God. Micah 6, 4 says, For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I set before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Like her brothers, she had a calling and a purpose on her life to be a leader, especially to women, as they wandered through the desert. Part of her calling was to lead the women in worship. We are all made to worship God. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. We often think that worship is just singing songs before God, or that it's the time before the pastor gets up to give the sermon, or that it's the act, opening act to warm up the crowd. People often skip worship, thinking that it's not a big deal. But worship is a huge deal. 
The common word for worship in the Bible literally means to bow down. It is an act of humble submission, bowing down, laying down our will, our desire, our plans, our life, and elevating God, that he is in control, that he directs my steps, that he plans out the days of my life. It is humble adoration for all that he has done, laying down my will and submitting to God's will. True worship is recognizing God's power and might and living a life in complete submission to his authority. Psalm 29, 2 says, Honor the Lord, you heavenly beings. Honor the Lord for his glory and strength. Honor the Lord for the, honor the, Lord for the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor and holiness, of his holiness. We are commanded to worship. We are created to worship. 1 Chronicles 16, 29 says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Although the second chapter in Miriam's life is small, it reveals her strong character. She is walking out her God-given calling, living in complete submission to God. And God is using her to lead the women. What a powerful picture. The third time we see Miriam, she's not the submissive young girl with strong faith and courage in the face of danger. She's also not the submissive leader who is leading the people boldly. She's older in life, and we see a shift in her character. We see Miriam prideful and not living her life in submission to God. Let's look at Numbers 12, 1 through 15. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud, and he stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous, as, snow, as white as snow. Then Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. Then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp seven days, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in again. In the third chapter of Miriam's life, we see an older Miriam who has grown bitter and critical of her brother's choices. How did she get here? From the girl with strong faith and courage to the woman who worshiped God and led others in worship to one who is critical and bitter. Her life is a reminder that none of us have arrived in our Christian walk. So how did she get here? From our text, I see three things that Miriam did. The first thing that I see is that she became discontent. She took her eyes off of God's will for her life and compared her life to her brother's. This allowed jealousy and envy to grow in her heart. Miriam had become critical of Moses' choices, specifically his choice of a wife. Although verse 2 reveals that the specific criticism is not the true issue. And isn't that often the truth about criticism? Criticism is often a deeper heart issue of the one who's doing the criticizing and not about the one who's the object of the criticism. 
And I'm not talking about constructive criticism because there is a place for that. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You can constructively criticize. There is a way to give that type of criticism that will edify and build up the person that you have an issue with. But this is not what Miriam is doing. Miriam's heart had become critical of her brother because she took her eyes off of her purpose and instead started to become jealous of Moses' purpose. She stopped submitting her will to God and instead wanted her own will. Miriam is basically asking, who does Moses think he is? She's suggesting that he's spiritually proud, thinking that he is the only one who God speaks with and for God. And ladies, can we just be honest with ourselves for a minute? Don't we all do this? More often and more regularly than we'd like to admit we do it. We often take our eyes off of Jesus and we look at other women and we compare. Roosevelt said comparison is the thief of joy and it's true. Comparing myself to other people does not make me feel good. It just makes me critical. Romans 12, four through eight says, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy uh, in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches, in teach. He who exhorts, exhort. He who gives with liberally. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. God has given each of us our own lane, and Miriam didn't stay in hers. She took her eyes off God and looked at Moses' lane and started to question his ability and his calling. But we all have our own calling. Myself and Stacy coordinated a wedding this weekend. And you know, if everyone stayed in their lane, or when everyone stayed in their lane, and they did the role that they were called to do, the day was smooth. But when one person stepped over their lane into another vendor's lane, it created confusion. It created doubt about what the role each person was supposed to play. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, 1 Corinthians 14, If we stay submitted to God's will, he will bring peace. If there's confusion, it might be a good time to self-reflect, to seek him and ask if you're truly submitted to his will. Are you really in the right lane? Miriam took her eyes off of her role and became jealous of the calling that Moses had on his life. The second thing I see that Miriam did was that she was gossiping about her brother Moses to Aaron. As, Mar as Miriam's discontent grew, she turned to her brother Aaron to talk about Moses, and the two of them criticized him together. She gossiped with her brother Aaron about it all. And don't we do that? Who does Moses think he is? I mean, we say, who does that woman think she is? Why is she wearing that? Why is she assigned to that ministry? Why is that person doing that job? And here's a newsflash. We're not God. We don't get to know why. It's that simple. I don't know why certain people are asked to do certain things and why certain people are given certain jobs and certain lanes. That's his job. I only know that God is in control and that I need to focus on what he has called me to do. And I need to stay in my lane and I need to submit to his authority. If someone in the lane next to me is not doing what God's called them to do, God will deal with it. I do not need to insert myself where God has not called me to be. The only place that Miriam should have taken her concern was to God. Her heart began to grow discontent. She started to see things in Moses that annoyed her or that she thought might be wrong. Negativity breeds more negativity, and like will find like. If I have an issue with something, I will be drawn to someone else who has that same thought, and then we can sit there together, going on and on about how we feel the exact same way and trying to solve all the world's problems. That's at least we tell ourselves. We're not solving any problems, though. We're creating more. But guess what? If I have a thought and I go talk to Sally, and Sally doesn't feel the same way, I'm not going to talk to her anymore about it. I'm going to go back to Jane, and I'm going to find Jane, because Jane will just give me what I want to hear, and we'll sit and we'll gossip all day long, and no good comes from it. 
Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. If there are words, if our words are not for building up, we should be filtering them and not allowing them to come out of our mouth. Do not let your words tear others down. Proverbs 21.2, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. God heard not just the words of Mary, uh, Miriam and Aaron, but he also heard their heart. God could see that Miriam was jealous of Moses' position. She had become discontent with her role and compared herself to Moses, allowing jealousy for his calling to sow in her heart, and she gossiped with Aaron about it. God sees through the heart of the matter. Matthew 12, 34, whatever is in the heart, the mouth will say. Miriam spoke lies about her brother, and it angers the Lord. The Lord reminds her that Moses is more humble than any man who walks the earth and that he is different than her and Aaron. Moses' calling on his life allowed him to have face-to-face -face interactions with God. We all have different callings on our life that will look different than the person next to you. The last thing that I see is that she questioned God's leadership and divine plan. James 4.11 in the NLT says, Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. When we question the calling and ability in another person, we are really questioning God and his authority and his divine plan. It shows that we do not have trust and faith in God's plan. Criticism is often born out of our own insecurities. We feel inferior and negative about ourselves, and we're looking to find fulfillment and happiness in something other than Jesus. Jesus is the only source of true joy. Turning to criticism or tearing down someone will never make you feel good. It will never make you feel better about yourself, and it certainly won't bring you joy. Our theme verse for women's ministry is Zephaniah 3.9. For then I will restore the people's pure lips, so that all of them may call on the name of the Lord to serve him shoulder to shoulder. You cannot walk shoulder to shoulder if you are looking to criticize the person next to you. If you are not serving God, and you're not serving God if you're criticizing others while you're doing it. We don't hear from Miriam again, until no, or about her even, until num Numbers 20, when her death is recorded. Moses' whole life, Miriam was a supporter of her brother, from the banks of the river, watching over him as a baby, to crossing through the Red Sea with him and leading the women into song and dance, worshiping God. So what changed? How did she get here? And I think we've all wondered that about at times, whether it's about ourselves or about our children or about a friend or a relative. How did it get so far off track? Miriam was a prophetess, a worship leader. She had great influence but she became discontent and jealous, and she took her eyes off the unique role that God had for her life. Song of Solomon 2.15 says, it is the little foxes that spoil the vines. This verse is written about the problems in life that negatively impact relationships. And I think it also applies here to Miriam's relationship with Moses and Aaron and her relationship with God. Miriam let the little foxes, the little sins of discontentment, jealousy, comparison, get in her head and they drove a wedge in her relationship with Moses and in her relationship with God. Miriam's punishment was harsh. But as we read in James 3, as a leader, as a teacher of woman, women like she was, she would have been held to a stricter judgment. Miriam's criticism had to be dealt with quickly and strictly so that her sin did not cause any other damage to the people. Sin is messy, and it spills on to those around you. It spreads like a wildfire, and God had to extinguish that fire with her punishment. Although she was healed of leprosy, it is believed that she was no longer used the same way in ministry again. Numbers 20 verse 1 says, Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. I have conflicting feelings about Miriam's life. On one hand, she had amazing courage and faith and strength, and she was a wonderful leader. But in the end, she let sin get in the way in the final chapter of her life. Her sin cost her her ministry. And I hope that the takeaway for all of us is that we need to stay in complete submission to God's will. And when we feel discontent or critical, 
that we bring it before the Lord and we let him direct our steps because he is the only place that we should ever go. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for the example, Lord, that Miriam's life is for us, Lord. That we can glean the wisdom, Lord, of what it looks like to live a life in full submission to you, Lord. That it looks bold, that it looks courageous, that it looks fearless, even though it's not. And God, that we also can see that when we live a life not in submission to you, Lord, that it's confusing, that it's painful, and that it involves a lot of loss. Lord, I pray that as we talk around our tables today and we go through our homework, Lord, that you would draw each of us closer, Lord, that you would allow each of us to be vulnerable with each other, and that we would be iron sharpening iron, Lord, and that we would look for ways that we could edify and encourage one another instead of ways that we could criticize and tear down. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen.